Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is the third talk in the creativity series. We're looking at digestion and today we'll examine the stomach and the tube that connects the mouth to the stomach, the esophagus. We'll look at the motion within that tube and how it's supported by a network of nerve tissue that manifests a kind of deep and innate intelligence that is related to what we call the gut brain, or maybe even to our sense of intuition and social connectedness. With that in mind, we'll also look at how the gut is very closely associated with our sense of social engagement and support from others, how it's affected by the quality of our relationships, particularly in early life. As I think we all know, digestion can be affected by our emotional state, by conflict, and by feelings of support and love. I won't be able to cover all aspects of this in a short video, but I hope to inspire some reflection so that we can begin to reconsider our relationship with our own digestive system. Let's begin. So the digestive system looks something like this. It's got a long tube that goes from mouth to stomach. The stomach is a kind of outpouching that connects to first the small and then the large intestines, which are quite long and are coiled inside the body. The large intestine ends at the rectum, which collects feces prior to defecation. When we talk about the digestive system from that anatomical perspective, we're using a conceptual way of understanding that's related to our very powerful human cognitive apparatus, what I'm going to refer to as the brain body, as mentioned in the first two talks of this series. That's in distinction to the sense of how we relate to our digestive system. So I mentioned how the digestive system is sensitive to the quality of our relationships. And we also have a kind of relationship ourselves with the foods we eat, how they feel inside our body, how our digestive processes function, whether they're smooth and comfortable or whether there's some kind of uneasiness or discomfort in the experience. All of that is relational and brings in the part of our human experience that is in fact quite relational and that I'm referring to as the heart body. But at the base of all of this is the direct tangible feeling of having a body that has volume and substance and mass. And we eat food that has volume and substance and mass, and we can feel it as we swallow it, as it travels down our esophagus. And we have a little bit less awareness, but we know, at least in principle, that it continues to travel through our body, through the digestive tube, being dissolved and broken down along the way. That very earthy or earthly sense of having a body, of feeling its sensations is what I refer to as the earth body experience. It comes into direct sensory availability again as our waste products that we call feces accumulate in the rectum and when we defecate. Clearly we can quite tangibly feel those experiences and they're often referred to as earthy in nature, emphasizing this aspect of the bodily experience its earthy quality. Now, if we were to think about it, we might realize that all experience begins as a sensation in the body, in the organism, in its tissues and its fluids and so on. There's some kind of sensation either in the bodily interior or related to input from our sensory apparatus such as sight and sound. And that input from the body pretty quickly 
establishes a sense of us in relationship to whatever happened. It's quite natural for us to sort of monitor on an ongoing basis everything that's happening and divide it into categories of what we like, that is to say, what we feel friendly toward, what we dislike, that is, what we're unfriendly toward, and a very large category that seems rather unimportant or neutral and that we don't pay a lot of attention to unless we are practicing mindfulness, for instance. Well, that sense of first having an earth body experience and then having a heart body relationship feeds upward into the cognitive apparatus, into what I'm calling the brain body, and we start to form some kind of storyline or understanding of whatever happened. So if I eat something that tastes icky to me, I immediately develop that reaction of not liking it, and I'll very quickly wonder, did the food uh, go bad? Had it spoiled, or was there too much salt in it? You know, what's the explanation? That's very automatic and it follows quite quickly, but there does, in many cases at least, seem to be a sequence of first the experience, then the relational quality, and then the storyline, earth, heart, and body. Now the storyline becomes yet another sort of experience that further feeds the relational quality. So if I think that somebody oversalted my food, I might feel irritated at the chef at the restaurant or whatever for adding too much salt and feel even a bit more peeved by this food that I was expecting to be really enjoyable and which is not. And once I feel even more peeved about the food and the chef, I'm likely to have even more negative thoughts, which are likely to stir up more agitation, and a cycle gets established. And I think we can all relate to this kind of cycle that happens pretty commonly, that we get caught in a ruminative spiral that can make us feel pretty miserable pretty quickly. Of course, a lot more could happen, uh, but this is a common uh, experience. One remedy for it is, in fact, mindfulness, which is to say to bring our attention back into the immediate sensory earth body experience somewhat prior to the relational feeling of the heart body or the storyline, the ideas and explanations served up by the brain body. Again, I want to emphasize these terms I use are chosen simply because they're not commonly used there are obviously ways of describing all this that are more familiar uh, in fields like psychology and in traditions like Buddhism. I'm staying away from more familiar terminology just so I can be as clear as possible about what I'm discussing without using terms that people might feel I'm misapplying, etc. Well, if we can stay grounded in the earth body the immediate, raw, mindful sensation of experience, somewhat free of judgment and story building, then we free the heart to manifest its full strength as an organ of compassion and connection. And we free the brain to display its lovely ability to see clearly and form wise discernments. So it isn't that the heart and brain bodies need to be neglected or denigrated. Of course, that would be rather silly to say that given their power. The point is to take mindful steps with our attention that can maximize our ability to use the capacities that come with our human organism. Now, in this series, I'm talking about the digestive system and in the first talk, I mentioned how one reason that it's a compelling topic for me is that about 10 years ago, I underwent a major abdominal procedure that taught me quite a bit about the centrality of this region of the body and all of its associations. What happened was I had lost a lot of weight in a short period of time. I had been treated for some major mood issues that followed the loss of my surgical career. The medications used for that treatment had caused me to become quite obese, and I 
was unhappy with my weight and began to undergo a uh, different treatment regimen with a new mental health provider, gradually tapering off my medications under uh, the supervision of my new psychiatrist, and I underwent a very concerted process of weight loss and lost the extra 70 pounds or so that I'd gained uh, in a little over a year's time. Evidently, what can happen, I learned, is that when weight loss is sudden like that, some people are predisposed to having a shift in the position of their diaphragm that causes an obstruction, a kinking, as it were, of a major artery that comes off the aorta. And that happened in my case, and it led to an internal hemorrhage and some other issues, and the surgery was meant to correct that. So you can see how already just describing what happened, that there was a lot to do with my relationship around food, and indeed a lot to do with my relationships in general, because my mood issues dated all the way back to early life trauma uh, that was being re-triggered, as it were, through the loss of my career. The incision obviously was quite large. These days, the same procedure could probably be done through small incisions using robotic instruments, but that was relatively new and unavailable technology at the time, and the surgeons I was consulting were using this more standard approach. And that approach meant that they cut through the abdominal musculature all the way through it and then dissected down to basically my spine, uh, which is where the aorta resides. Well, by cutting through all that musculature, they revealed to me another important aspect of this region of the body. And that's that our so-called core musculature, the stuff that we strengthen uh, in yoga classes and so on, is active with almost every movement. So that for weeks after the surgery, I would feel pain in my incision when I did something as simple as lift a full cup of tea, for instance. Just that little bit of exertion would cause me to tighten my abdominal core and because of the a healing process that was painful every single time. So I was immediately brought into a direct connection with this region of the body that we could refer to as our soft underbelly. That idea of a soft underbelly emphasizes how vulnerable this region is because after all, within the belly, Behind that musculature is the digestive tract, particularly the stomach and the intestines. So this central region with its covering of muscle and by and large uh, lack of covering by bone is quite vulnerable. Now it's vulnerable because of the digestive system itself and it's also vulnerable because of the accessory organs associated with the digestive tract, the liver and the pancreas, and for completeness, uh, the heart is also in the area, although it is tucked up more behind the rib cage, and so is a bit less uh, vulnerable in the sense it's more protected by bone. But this region of the body is clearly a sensitive one, as I certainly learned when I had that big operation. And it's sensitive not just in a physical, somatic sense, but also in an emotional sense. So that when we see a chubby little critter like this one, there can be a feeling of happiness, like this animal is well-fed. Quite possibly it's a bit overfed, but there's still something rather charming about seeing an animal that looks like it's well-nourished. In the old days, before we became obsessed with thinness, the same feeling arose when we saw chubby people. It's why Santa Claus was traditionally portrayed as having a big belly that would jiggle when he laughed. There was something happy and presumed to be healthy about that. Because after all, to be well fed for a biological creature uh, is really an advantage. So what's being presented here, I hope, is the idea that we can look at this region of the body from the two perspectives, one relating to what I'm calling the brain body and the other more about the relational aspect and associated with the uh, so-called heart body, 
right? So on the brain body side, there's anatomy and structure, and on the heart body side, there's the feeling of affinity for an animal being well-nourished. Well, the belly has another association, that is to pregnancy, and we're not talking about the reproductive system, but I'd like to show this charming video that I found on YouTube that the creators have kindly released into the public domain. It's a couple who took the time to create time-lapsed photographs of the woman's pregnancy, as you'll see. So that just brings in another association, a relational heart-body association that we have with the belly, not directly connected to the digestive system, although certainly indirectly connected because, of course, the mother needs to eat extra calories to support the growth of the new organism that develops in the uterus. The relational aspect of digestion comes into play when we think about family meals, such as around the holidays. In the ideal, there's a sense of this being a joyous time of connection and mutual support and appreciation. Of course, things are not always ideal, and many families, including my own, had experiences around the table which were more conflictual or frightening. Either way, we internalize this in our bodies and in particular in our digestion. Our digestive systems can carry a memory, an implicit memory, of these relational aspects of mealtime. So I already mentioned how the surgery that I underwent was related to a condition that grew out of my use of psychiatric medications for mood issues. And those mood issues, as I mentioned, were related to early life trauma. So there was, first of all, the mood issues themselves that led to the medications, that led to the weight changes, uh, that caused everything uh, that led up to the surgery. That was one direct connection between what I went through and my early life experience. But there was also something deeper it's been shown that abdominal pain and abdominal and digestive issues are far more common in people with higher uh, rates of childhood ad adversity than in those who are fortunate to have avoided much of that. So all the way around, this experience was connected uh, in a relational way to my early life, as many digestive issues are for many people. Now, if that were the end of the story, it would be rather tragic. But as I've tried to point out, there is also the possibility, and in some cases I think almost an inevitability, that if we remain mindful and continue to work toward healing and recovering from whatever happened to us, that there will be a natural process of digestion. We might say psycho-spiritual digestion, so that the hardship that we went through will take on new meaning. And even though, yes, we may carry scars that will be with us lifelong, we will also gain the benefits of learning from these hardships and these difficult experiences. And this is the basis for a certain kind of creative growth. So going back to the question of meals, Throughout most of human history, they were probably only rarely a solitary affair. Now, certainly there can be pleasure in cooking for oneself and eating by oneself. But I think that there tends to be more pleasure when we bring in the relational quality, the social aspect, in the shopping and in the preparation of the meal. And of course, that social quality 
goes even further when we eat the meal in community with people that make us feel safe and supported. So again, we can look at the digestive tract from these two perspectives. On the one hand, the anatomical, conceptual, brain-body perspective, and on the other, the social, relational, heart-body perspective. All of this feeds into our experience, and all of it is useful for meditation. There is another aspect to all of this, though, that is worth considering, and that's the more earthy aspect of digestion what's going on in a tangible, material sense within the body, bringing us back to our friend, the earthworm, who has been mentioned a few times uh, in this series. So the digestive system we carry within us now is an evolutionary descendant from the simple, linear digestive system of an earlier worm-like ancestor. So that simple tube has elaborated into a more complex system with the esophagus connecting mouth to stomach, the stomach as a large collecting pouch, and the coils of intestines, and so on. What I'd like to focus on as we bring into the discussion a more earthly quality is the esophagus. And in fact, what we'll be looking at is general to the entire digestive tube. But let's imagine that we're discussing for the moment just the experience of swallowing food and feeling it kind of move down from mouth toward stomach. So some bit of food is available to us, we chew it up and swallow it, and it ends up in the esophagus. It then moves down the esophagus Partly, it's propelled by gravity, assuming we're upright, but more importantly, it's propelled by muscular constriction. As I mentioned in the last talk, there is a way that the digestive tube has of creating a synchronized wave of contraction and lengthening. That synchronized movement is technically called peristalsis, and it serves to propel the food down the tube in the manner shown in this simple animation. It's possible because the tubes are complex layered structures with muscle that sometimes runs lengthwise along the tube and in other layers runs circularly around the tube. And the coordinated contraction and relaxation of these different muscle layers gives the sort of peristaltic movement that we just viewed. That depends on input from nerve fibers that are highlighted uh, in the oval box here. So the nerves allow for this coordinated movement that is directly generated by the layers of muscle. This is very similar to the movement that we looked at in the last talk in the earthworm, how segments can constrict and lengthen in coordinated ways. This, of course, is happening not in our whole body, uh, as it is in the case of the earthworm, but in the digestive tube in isolation. But the overall effect is quite similar. And even right now, as we watch this video, or as I uh, produce it, intestines are going through movements rather like this. And so is the stomach, most likely. Speaking of the stomach, it has its own layers of musculature, a little more complex, there is an intermediate layer. It also has its own nerve supply that I'm kind of exaggerating in this image for effect, but there are lots of nerves wrapping around the stomach as there are around the entire digestive tract. One estimate I've heard about the number of these neurons and how powerful they are in information processing terms is that there are roughly the same number of neurons as there are in the brain of, for instance, a cat. So this highlights the idea that we have this inner gut intelligence that's related to our social connections, related to our intuition, 
related to how we feel inside, but is also the basis for the movement of the gut itself. Now the stomach secretes a solution that consists of acid and enzymes. And it's important for digestion that the food get agitated a bit inside the stomach, stirred up as it were, so that the digestive fluids can have their effect. And then eventually the stomach needs to propel the digesting material further along the system into the intestines. So we can take a look at this. Here we're now looking down into a stomach. This is a fiber optic view such as a gastroenterologist would have of an actual human stomach. And we can see the waves of peristaltic movement as they start near the top of the stomach and then progress downward in a sequential coordinated way. This movement is ongoing. It serves to agitate or stir the food and it serves to propel the stuff that's you know, getting dissolved and broken down and so on, to propel all of that forward into the intestines. So we can imagine, for the purposes of connecting with our digestive system, that it's got this feeling intelligence within it. And this isn't pure fantasy. It's based on a very large number of neurons that are in fact performing uh, important tasks of coordination and information processing. But it's nice to actually kind of envision these biological forms that make up the digestive tract as a kind of organism in their own right. Okay, so the digestive tube could be felt within as an inner life form that supports our larger life and is part of it, but which it has its own independence and its own intelligence. In other words, we can relate to this inner experience of digestion using the aspect of bodily experience I'm calling the heart body. Now, at the same time, there is that tangible earthly quality of the movement itself, of feeling the gurgling in the uh, stomach and in the belly, feeling the movement of food as we swallow it and it begins its journey down the esophagus, etc. So we could bring in the sense of the earth body as part of our experience. And this is a useful point for meditation to work with the tangible earthly nature of digestion in the belly and also our relational experience of it in our heart region. The practice would be to feel the tangible sensations wherever they arise in the abdomen, perhaps a sense of fullness or emptiness in the stomach or in the rectal region and to notice as we scan for direct bodily, earthy sensations, what emotional feelings arise, sense of pleasure, displeasure, safety, or fear, and so on, and thus begin to connect the various bodies of experience with one another. <laughs> 